everyone. I think we can start now. First of all, I would um, ask everyone to please mute their microphones and switch up their cameras because of the internet connection. It would be better if only the speakers have their cameras switched on. You can find the button on the toolbox displayed on your screen and there um, in the, this, the icon on the left side which shows a camera, you can turn your camera off and then the next item icon you can mute yourself. Thank you. So yeah, welcome everybody to the webinar on flexibilization of coal-fired power plants. My name is uh, Theresa Jocham and I'm working for the ITIF support office here in New Delhi. Um, this webinar is an initiative of the ITIF task force flexibility under the chairmanship of Sri Tivari Chi, Director Operations at TPC. First of all, we would like to thank the co-chairs of the ITIF subgroup Subworking Group Flexibility of Thermal Power Plants, Dr. Falken Grossa, Head of Bilateral Energy Cooperation, Ministry for Energy Government of Germany, and Sri Divanganti, Joint Secretary Thermal, Ministry of Power Government of India. So yes, as I said before we start the webinar, let me give you a short, shortly some technical information. So please keep your microphones muted during the whole webinar and your cameras turned off. Um, you can see the webinar in full screen if you go to the toolbar displayed on the bottom of your screen with all the icons displayed. And there in the middle of the toolbar, you find three dots if you click on them. The third option from the top says enter full screen. If you click the button, you can see the whole webinar in full screen on your device. If you have any technical difficulties, please let, please let us know via the chat. To do so, you can find the icon in the toolbar. Um, and this icon looks like a dialog box. So if you click on it, you can enter the chat and let us know if you have any problems. Um, after each presentation, we will have a, a short Q&A session. So, um, if you have any questions, please also type them in the chat and please keep yourself muted. So, yes, with us today we have Dr. Claudia Weise and Mr. Zinner. I hope you can also see them. They should have their cameras switched on. Um, but for sure you will see them later when they have, when they have their presentation. So Dr. Weiser is a project manager at the VGB PowerTech and she is responsible for international projects for energy plant operators based in Germany. The flexibility of power systems, in particular flexible power generation, has been one of the key topics of Dr. Weiser's activities. And besides her, we have Mr. Zinner with us today. He's a power professional with 30 years of experience in the power business. He's Please mute your microphone and switch off your camera. Thank you. Um, so Mr. Sinha is associated with the preparation of fossil-based units for flexible operation and the formulation of market mechanism to facilitate renewable energy and integration. So thank you both for being part of the webinar. And please, Dr. Weiser, the floor is yours. So, uh, good morning or good afternoon to everybody. Namaskar. Um, I thank you for your interest in the topic of flexibilization in thermal power plants. And um, I would like to present in this uh, opening session uh, our European experiences which we made in, in this topic and want to give you some context uh, of the whole issue. Um, during my presentation I would like uh, to switch off my camera in order to uh, reduce um, the data transmission rate. So um, I'm from VGB PowerTech and VGB PowerTech is the International Technical Association for Energy Plant Operators. 
and we serve as a sector platform and support our members via standardization, innovation activities, and especially also via experience exchange. And I would like to share with you today some experiences which we uh, made in the field of flexibilization of thermal power plants. Okay. When we talk, when we talk about uh, flexibilization, now I, I just have to. I cannot uh, move my slides now. Yeah, now it's working. So the technology is um, always an issue as we experienced in the beginning. So the video actually also had a audio and um, yeah, but this, these are the things we have to deal these times with um, that technology is not always functioning. Okay, coming back to our topic. So when we talk about um, energy, it's very important to um, have the framework in mind. So the energy development is clearly driven by policy targets. And in order to give you some um, insight into the situation in Europe and in Germany, I have summarized here uh, on this slide the, the main uh, targets with respect to energy policy. I would like to draw your attention especially to the targets uh, with respect to greenhouse gas emission reduction and to the share of renewable, uh, renewable energies. So in Europe, you see that until 2030, it's uh, targeted to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions by 40% and to rise the share in the renewable energy consumption um, to 32%. And in Germany, you see um, at a different time scale here different targets. So one target is that we want to phase out nuclear power plants within two years and uh, we want to um, a rise the share of renewables in electricity generation by 45 percent until 2025. So we have very ambitious targets and under the uh, newly um, um, decided European Green Deal, um, Europe has even um, no, the, sorry no. the presentation got lost. So the Green Deal um, includes a commitment that Europe becomes climate neutral until 2050. So this is a framework and there's clearly the way towards to the renewables and this way clearly has an impact on the operational regime of the thermal power plants. And how does it look like? I would like to explain um, uh, on the basis uh, of the example of Germany. And therefore, I, I have put here the German power generation mix of last year. And uh, you see here that we have an installed capacity of about 224 gigawatts. And more of the half of it is coming from the renewables. The gross electricity generation last year was around uh, 611 terawatt hours. As you can see in the graph, we have a very diverse energy mix and uh, the share of renewables accounted for almost 40% in gross electricity generation last year. That was a new record and what was also remarkable um, is the fact that the wind has become the main source of uh, electricity generation in Germany for the first time. Uh, looking to the conventional and fossil uh, sources, uh, we have here the, uh, our indigenous fuel lignite. We have imported hard coal and natural gas. 
and they all together um, account for almost 43 percent, but on a very uh, declining path. So especially hard coal has been seen uh, declining over the past years um, uh, in a very extreme way. And as I said, the nuclear portion here, 12 uh, percent, um, this will be um, uh, phased out within the next two years. Coming back to the renewables, so as I said, wind is a main source here, and we see that uh, it's uh, contributing by more than 50 percent, followed by photovoltaic, uh, biomass and hydro. So the rising share of the variable renewables, uh, PV and wind, um, really makes a difference in the whole um, operation of the energy system. So as they are a variable and have an unsteady uh, feed in, the whole energy system needs to be adjusted according to them. And here in Germany, we see that they account for um, more than 38% uh, in the energy mix already. So what challenges are associated uh, with this will be part of uh, the presentation. But before I come to this, I would also like to mention that um, uh, besides nuclear, and especially in the view of the climate neutrality discussion, the coal phase out in Europe has already started. So here you see a very recent slide uh, which shows the status of the coal phase out in different European countries. So you, you see Germany here in the middle and there it's indicated that Germany has decided um, to step out uh, in the year 2038. And uh, in other countries, they are even more fast and the uh, coal phase out is um, quite earlier. Only a few um, Eastern European countries um, haven't started any discussion about coal phase out yet. Uh, however, one can um, say that the political acceptance of coal based generation in Europe is really um, decreasing and we see a pressure to change to other technologies like gas uh, based generation or energy storage and also a push for other new technologies in the field of sector coupling. I would like to come back to the issue of the rising share of variable renewables and what um, are the consequences out of this? Um, this is shown here at this slide uh, where you see the power generation uh, portfolio in Germany last month. So um, we see the contributions of the different energy sources here in the different colors and the variables, uh, variable renewables like wind in blue and PV in yellow are indicated here. And you see different situations which I have indicated um, here. So there were days when we have a lot of wind and sunshine and um, so the PV and wind were able to almost fully um, supply the energy which uh, was demanded at that time. So the energy demand here is indicated in the pink line. So the difference between the variable renewable feed-in and the energy demand is um, the so-called residual load. And this residual load needs to be supplied by other sources. And these are mainly conventional dispatchable power plants. So the higher the share of variable renewables, the higher the fluctuation of this residual load. So here you see another situation at the beginning of March. So less sunshine and wind. So the difference, the residual load here 
uh, is uh, quite higher. And so this needs to be compensated then by the conventional fleet. So the just to to uh, um, to complement this, so the the peak load demand in Germany is about 80 gigawatt. So on this slide, you see the consequences for the coal-fired power plants uh, for their operation. The same chart for March. And here you see just the um, operation or the supply by the lignite and uh, hard coal power plants. And you see that they are ramping and uh, cycling all the time and uh, providing the residual load according to the demand. And especially the hard coal fleet is really doing the most of the cycling and uh, flexing which is required. So they, um, these plants are very well adapted to this um, operational regime and they even um, are faced with two shifting operation or shutdowns over weekend, which you can see here in these um, uh, contributions or less contributions uh, during the weekend. And lignite power plants also uh, do some cycling, not to that extent uh, as the hard coal power plants do, but um, one can say that the coal-fired power plants, the cycling and flex, flex uh, operation is daily business for them. So to, um, to derive some generic statements out of these examples, um, we see that the future electricity supply will be mainly based on three uh, columns, so to say. So we will have a very big share of variable generation by wind and PV. And this variable generation requires flexibility. And this flexibility is supplied by two options. One option is the energy storage. And um, examples are given here. So pump storage, batteries, thermal storage or power to X. Um, but in the, absence, in the absence of a commercial viable solution at the moment, most of the flexibility um, needs to be provided by dispatchable uh, power generation. And this re mainly refers to uh, thermal power plants. So these both um, have to deliver the uh, required flexibility and of course um, also the uh, associated to this the residual load which is required to secure the supply of energy. So that is why in a, a future energy system the flexibility of power plants is really a must. And uh, when we talk about uh, flexible power uh, plant operation, we mainly refer to three different aspects. The first aspect is a low minimum load. That means stable power plant operation without any support firing or oil supply. The second is um, high ramp rates, which uh, makes the plan um, able to adjust the power output according to the to the uh, needs um, of the demand. And the third one is the abil ability to um, have short startups and shutdowns. So these three parameters are uh, characterizing the flexibility of a power plant. And uh, in order to operate a plant flexible, it's really required to have a new way of thinking um, how to operate your plan. So the whole operational philosophy is changing. And um, this uh, is not only a technical issue, it's only 
it's also a mental issue. So when you start to transform your plant or fleet into a flexible one, you also need to consider to, um, um, to plan for uh, dedicated trainings um, to um, sensitize and to, to um, make your people aware of the necessity for flexible operation, but also to provide the according skills which uh, are needed to operate a plant in this way. And um, we, we also see that uh, the flexibility um, has become a key cri uh, design criteria. This is really um, becoming the, the ruling driver in the technology development and also for, for further innovations. So um, to sum it up, um, the flexibility is a, a must have a feature for thermal power plants and it's really essential to have it because this is a facilitator for the system variable renewables because they both together um, ensure a stable energy supply and um, a safe system. And uh, reflect on the on the different drivers for power plant technology. Um, I have put here uh, a time scale to show um, how the this has changed over the last decades. So going back to these here in Europe. There was a strong requirement to um, to establish a lot of new capacity, uh, power plant capacity. So this was the main driver then. And then, for instance, in the 1980s, when the environmental issues become uh, very um, um, prominent and the public awareness was raised, um, the emission the key issue by then and um, for for a long time after this the efficiency the key driver to develop for further developments higher te steam temperatures were um, aimed for and this uh, focus has been shifted for the last yeah, almost decade, I would say there was a shift from efficiency to flexibility. So now we all um, um, make our plants more flexible. Of course, it's also a requirement to um, to increase the part load efficiency, but it's always under the big target to have a very um, dynamic plan in place to adjust to the new uh, conditions. So um, what has been achieved so far? So on this slide, you see um, meters of dispatchable generation technologies. So here Figures are listed for um, pump storage and combined cycle uh, plants, but I would like to focus on the coal plants. So here you see the, the I mentioned, so the ramp rate, the minimum load, and the startup uh, time. Use for, for each um, type of coal. So that refers to a conservative state of the art and advanced uh, technologies. So I would like to draw your attention here to this. So for hardcore in Europe, um, some plants even achieve a minimum load of 10%. So um, without any oil support, requires a certain coal and um, adaptions um, of the plant with respect to the combustion system. 
associated, for instance, the operation and uh, the adaptations of the boiler protection system. If you want to achieve this low number. But uh, in in principle, these, these the other values like 40 to 25 or here for lignite 60 to 40, uh, this is really um, a normal. These are normal values and our experiences show that um, the achievement of these values so the main lever to do so is an adjustment of the INC system. So the optimization of automation and controls, um, this means main and underlying control loops is here um, key. So you need a smooth and precise steam temperature control, optimized underlying control loops, for instance, for a cold supply, um, for temperature, for the airflow, etc. And also you need to um, remove any interlocks uh, which might come from, from, your, um, from your logic. So this needs to be reduced and uh, you also could check whether um, part load efficiency um, might be increased if you have a um, smooth switch over between redundant uh, uh, machines, for instance, for uh, feed water pumps or PA fans or whatever. So the optimization of the INC system here is from our experiences uh, key and also the, the optimization of the combustion system um, with reliable uh, flame detection and uh, according control is uh, very important. The technical measures will be explained uh, in the presentation um, by, by Anshan Sina. So he will go into detail of this. And um, I would like to conclude my um, uh, presentation with some uh, hints um, where you find more information about the topic. So we at VGB, we have um, compiled a special uh, where we have collected all the reports and um, articles and uh, on, on this website and attention especially to our flexibility power plants which uh, includes an open measures and estimations and time scales for implementation so this uh, flexibility in outcome of the uh, indo-german energy cooperation so on several studies uh, under the IGF uh, together with partners for, from the Indian Excellence Enhancement Centers, Center with NTPC and other Indian colleagues and also with our VGB uh, members. And one of the exercise uh, which we did um, under the Indo-German Energy Forum was also um, dedicated to flexibilization of Indian power plants. So we did a test run at the Dadri uh, power plant unit six, and uh, we achieved their minimum load operation of 40%. And um, Anshan Sinha will uh, provide you more information about the lessons learned and experience. Um, So that brings me to the end of the presentation. Um, show you the necessity for flexibilization and to give you some um, insights into European experiences and um, lessons learned. Thank you. And now I'm looking forward 
to your questions. Advisor for this very interesting presentation. Um, the link to the flexibility website of um, VGB you can also find in the chat of this webinar. We just posted it. Um, yes, so I think we can allow some questions now. If you have some, please click on the dialog box in the toolbar and type in your question directly. Let's see. We can, yes, um, okay, so, but we can also um, start with the presentation of uh, Mr. Zinner now, and then at the end we will have a Q&A session on this presentation, but I think if you then have a question to Dr. Weiser, she's also happy to answer that at the end of the webinar. So please, uh, Mr. Zinner, the floor is yours. You can start your presentation now. Okay, uh, thank you, Teresa. Am I audible? Yeah, okay. audible. Yeah, thank you, Teresa. Uh, thank you, Lisa, Dr. Weise, colleagues from uh, IGF, participants. Good afternoon, uh, good morning, good evening, depending upon where you are. Uh, I welcome you all to this webinar on experience sharing. Uh, this will be based on, on all the experiences that we have had with VGB, uh, with the IGF, e feasibility studies at different stations, uh, test runs, particularly in uh, NTPC Dadri. We'll focus on NTPC Dadri. We have had a lot of more test runs in other stations, but Dadri is in advanced stage of implementation. A lot of experience on Dadri, we'll be sharing that. So these are the topics that I'll cover. The initial few slides of my presentation will essentially cover the basic uh, basics of flexibilization. And why do we need it? Uh, a bit on, on the economics so that you understand whenever you are operating a plant, it's not only the technical part, but you'll be operating in a market. So I'll be running through these uh, slides initially uh, to give you a brief idea on that. And, and it's a very long presentation, so I'll try to cover up within the time. So uh, I'll start uh, with the first slide uh, with a few questions. Uh, it would be a thought-provoking question, and we'll find the answers as we walk through the presentation. So here, this is a scheduling of a typical ISGS station of one day. I've taken it for April 20th. Many of the stations, they uh, it's not because of RE entirely. There are many reasons. LCD one is one reason, and, and there can be uh, reasons for the demand side. Again, uh, the recent COVID, it has thrown up. So it was happening in the Indian power sector, but it has accelerated with the present uh, scenario of this COVID. In this, we see that in one station, in one of 24 hours, there are different first ramp sizes around percent of the load. This period of time, here it's 50. There is a load operation for a long time. Again, we have seen that uh, a ramp of 45 percent now, with a ramp rate of 2 percent. So now, are you aware what what you are doing to the machines by operating it in this way? If you are not prepared, then, then you won't be able to operate for very long. That is for sure. 
I'll show you why. So typically, there is a cost of for each. I'll just hide. Each such ramp, I'll talk about the significant ramp. You will incur at least two lakh. Uh, so here I have taken minimum seven. So seven into two, fourteen lakhs that the generator is incurring in terms of their increased O and M cost. And and in the present market mechanism, in the present regulatory mechanism, there is no way you get this money. So now this is a well-known curve. Everybody uh, is aware of this. Uh, this is the Indian duck curve that would evolve in 2022. I've taken it for one particular day. That is 19th of July. So, and and this is the RE, mostly solar and wind, everything taken together. So this would be the power needed from coal. Because all other things I have included here, gas and all uh, hydro also. Because see, in in July you won't get dispatchable power from from say like hydro. We have a very limited capacity of storage type hydro. So see the demand or the requirement from from coal. In the morning, 108 gigawatt, uh, and and from there, in the afternoon, four gigawatt. Again, in the evening, it will be 118 gigawatt. So what does that mean? Plants will still be operating on a base load, some on, on low load and some maybe on a two shifting operation. And, and then you have to again uh, uh, explain the relevance of coal stations once again. How relevant you are? Are you able to provide this? And you'll have to evaluate the value of your station. In fact, each every, each unit within the country will have to evaluate in terms of value of flexibilization and with the real time market, which is uh, expected to come in June, a lot of things will change in the ground. And if you are able to deliver the value of flexibilization, balancing power, then even the higher cost unit, they'll survive. Otherwise, they'll simply be shut down. So this is a slide uh, I'm showing uh, about the economics of. So there are balancing mechanisms for the grid from system operation perspectives to the markets and, and the Indian policymakers, say regulators, dispatchers, they're all working together. And this is in terms of these are the low hanging fruits. Already with grid codes, we have seen this uh, Indian electricity grid code, which is coming, they are evolving. So right now, what we'll be discussing, and see even the batteries, they are somewhere here in terms of cost. They need to come down. Coal flexibilization is somewhere here. Hydro, because of limited capability of uh, storage hydro, we are still, uh, we won't be able to deliver that much requirement of uh, flexibility into the grid. Gas is the next option here also because of limited uh, availability of gas. Uh, we have other limitations and we require most of the balancing power from coal stations. Now, you remember what happened last month uh, with uh, auction, Seki auction, uh, where they had offered peak off peak two types of tariff. Lowest was two rupees 88 paisa along with storage. So, now coal will be competing with that value. And if there are cheaper options, uh, it will everything will be decided based on the economics. So it is very important to see, see where you stand in terms of economics, how cheap you are able to deliver this flexible operation. Now, before you understand the flexibility operation, why we did these studies, you need to understand some harsh realities of cyclic operation. It, it, there's no doubt about it that flexible operation is a difficult mode of operation. And even the most conservative approach will increase the o and variable cost. It, it may be that that somebody, some operator, if they operate it in a, in a bad way, they'll, they'll multiply those numbers, the o and cost. Uh, 
but but however uh, those plants which can operate flexibly in the five and they'll continue to be dispatched but for that you need investment come out with uh, changes in your uh, manpower needs to be trained see the manpower in the in india they are very trained ma manpower but they have been all trained for base load operations today when you talk to the operators uh, they are afraid of many things uh, like when when you tell them to operate a simple hp bypass and they are fearful they they fear that what will happen maybe the unit will trip on drum level and all but we have seen these things happening in germany last year also so they were training uh, under this igf program we had visited the simulators we had visited a couple of senior that they are operating it's they operate the hp by and and it will take minimum 5 to 10 minutes for for boiler to stabilize if you raise or lower the loads to uh, coal uh but 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 another thing you need to understand is when you are doing flexi uh, flexing of the units and and if there is a lack of awareness that can be disastrous and that is what we have seen many of the state genkos they are approaching us for support uh, at least there are five six state genkos who have lot of cost overruns on the ondm cost uh, for the past two because they were flexing their units without being aware of that without being aware of the consequences and another thing is damage to the machines that won't be felt to you immediately they keep on accumulating and when the first symptoms appear it may be very late to uh, correct the damages and it may be very costly you may end up with uh, complete replacement of your capital equipment so this uh, slide you need to understand uh, on 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 basically uh, what is the cycling and and what are the modes of cycling what are the damages done on different modes so this is load following ll1 means uh, mild load following ll2 moderate load following and ll3 is a severe load following what we call as significant load following and there's a cost to it in terms of the damage and in terms of the money that you need to spend to cover up those damages reclaim those uh, damages from the machine typically this is around 20 to 50000 rupees for one event one cycle once you raise the load and lower it next is hot start it's more than that here the cost is 20 to 38 lakhs per event one hot start one start and one shutdown cycle warm is even more and costliest is cold start which is 42 to 90 this study is in four units and, and and there's a wide range wide variation between the units so you must be aware of your cost what what are the cost uh, that you incur in your unit and and tomorrow when the real time be aware of your cost because market will give you the signal but but product that you are pr producing when you yourself don't know the price of your product so th that is very important that uh, then is shown you on uh, load following still i consider it as a better option if you have to perform a cold start to reduce unit and if you are able to stay on bar so you need to prepare so i have th these are some of the pictures uh, most of them are from the indian part problems on on what can be the damages uh, due to flexible uh, operation and due to lack of awareness it's mostly due to the uh, temperature transients and uh, first is cracking cracking of the stubs uh this is uh, uh this is the portion from where this damage had happened this is undamaged this is another cracking so i'll quickly go through these damages this is again short term overheating long term overheating 
for example this one was happened uh, uh, 3 hours after a startup the startup we analyzed the startup also there was the so there is a guideline that we have prepared and and, and will make that public to all of you so what should be the limit transients this is based on uh, international literature on all our studies and and there are lot of stakeholders involved in in preparing this including epri intertech vgb some some data is from vgb and and, and uh, this this is just a short portion that i have put in here more you'll get in details there's another station where the whole bottom ash came down there was a explosion in the bottom ash area during low load operation and and immediately before that they performed suit blowing operation so you need to know the operation procedures during the low load this is from our uh, one of the units in in india uh, the internals have corroded and and it, it's very short time that that this one reason is when you are continuously operating your flue gas temperature close to your acid dew point for a very long time these things will happen and this is exactly what happened after they had analyzed the data of past one or two years that found that it was being operated on a continuous mode for the acid dew point from the in the turbine blades pitting then this is a portion of the nozzle which has got damaged this is the turbine seals with changing load conditions that there's a lot of uh, damages that that happens uh, in the city if you don't maintain your seal air temperature because you at a very low load the leak off steam goes off and, and then you need to take in seal steam from your uh, prds header and if it is not drained there may be some water ingress into the lines cause some condensation in the pipes uh what in the low load that comes here and there's a lot of chilling uh, into the system the seals get damaged this is a result of all these things this causes further delays chemist so so from the, the there's uh, which was completely choked and and this is what was removed from there this is again from an indian power station see the deposits damage to the strainers so even if you think that the strainers will stop these uh, it, it won't many of the uh, incidents they have come out of the strainer and hit the turbine blades this is a deposit on a plate so this happens when when uh, there is already a deposit due to your faulty chemistry practices and there is a white like thermal shocks temperature transients they come out and and they they collect in the pipe and and they travel through right up to the turbine this is another inc incident this is a primary air fan this has been damaged due to stalling of the pf flow and and this typically happens during low load operation uh portion where there was an explosion and it uh, power station of uh, every component has a fatigue and a creep life life a slide that i had picked up from from g uh, this has also been included in in at seen in add uh, in european technology department is numbers so this is fixed and you consume it and how much you consume depends upon uh, the way you operate because if there are more temperature transients and and you do a bad cyclic of this is a creep life and this is the fatigue life this is another slide from epri uh visible operation on of on a long time so you see that there is a increase in efor means equivalent forced outage rate if efor means your partial loss plus forced outage what what we uh, consider in india because in india we consider this separately forced outage as separate and 
it. All of them are together. When the unit is under standards are down, this one six percent. See, extended shutdown also for machine. You need to follow proper layup procedures, and and for long layup procedures, uh, units do follow uh, some practice. But for short, mostly it is ignored, and and there the damages are more because because of the temperature uh, characteristics and and others. Even if your your machine is shut down for say typically half a day, uh, then also you cannot ignore uh, that. You need to have some sort of preservation or not, uh, like nitrogen blanketing, and there are a lot of other practices. Load following minimum load is seven point nine, and worst thing that you can do is two shifting, eleven to twelve percent, and and many of the stations they are in and going to be in that sort of mode very soon, because. Demand is almost fixed, and for for I think for one or two years it will be like that. Lot of Aries getting added up with different market mechanisms. Lot of things are going to change on the ground. This is summary of all the damages what I had shown you in the pictures. So you can read it. I won't be discussing all of that. Uh, some of them I'll point out. There have been damages in the feed water uh, uh, circuit. And uh, because you are not charging staff, uh, steam coil air peter, we have seen uh, damages in many areas, uh, even in air peters, uh, cold and ba basket corrosion, uh, LP turbine last stage blades. Uh, for that also, the one picture that I was showing, it was there. Uh, some stations they don't charge or they delay the charging of derator uh, heater heating, means uh, pegging steam to the derator. And that caused the temperature transient. Piping, piping, uh, hanger, support. This is an ignored area in the plant, and and uh, you need to check. You need to have proper checklists. So in the procedures which will be made public, uh, other day also I was presenting in the other forum. Uh, I mentioned about a detailed procedures. That we are going to make public uh, very soon. So we have all these procedures: how to check, what to check about the layer procedures. Everything would be there. Now, uh, flexible operation. Some of these things, I think, uh, Dr. Wise mentioned about the interventions carried out through international support on IGF task force. So. Others like USAID, they are also doing a uh, lot of studies, and uh, I am also involved in that. So NTPC, Ramagundam, Jhajar, we did studies, cost of cycling, uh, test runs, uh, we did at Mauda, and the very recent one in March first week at Ukai, Gujarat. Uh, for compensation mechanisms, uh, for for flexible operation. Uh, apart from there, there are uh, other regulatory support also we are giving to CRC. NG lab that was conducted in NTPC uh, on two stations. A study, it's, uh, they have already done it at uh, NTPC Vindachal. Then some interventions done by the Indian stakeholders by G at NTPC. Uh, test runs are there. Some test runs NTPC did it uh, on their own, and GSCSL also. Like uh, Gujarat did it at one Buri, uh, and NTPC did at many of these stations. Uh, BHL has always been there. Siemens, they are very important stakeholders for doing this. In the IGF, Siemens has been a very very important stakeholders for for supporting this whole initiative. And in fact, without this OEM and OEDs, uh, we cannot go ahead. Because any interventions that will be carrying out in the future, it will be through these OEMs. Condensate throttling, many of you are aware of that. Uh, recent one, APC and uh, Simhadri. There also it has been implemented and it's on the PG test. AGC and, and again some re regulatory interventions they are going on. So. In the beginning of the presentation, I had mentioned about the value, what value a particular plant 
a particular unit would provide to the grid. So along with CA, we have conducted studies on, on in fact, each and every unit of the country based on certain criteria. So this, these are the criteria and we have categorized unit, each and every unit state-wise where they're located. Uh, and units would uh, typically be on, on, on these categories, base load, low load, and, and some would need efficiency retrofit because you cannot afford to run these units at a very low efficiency, 2800, uh, 2900 uh, heat rate. And, and some units, they won't have any option other than retire and replace. Retire and then go for some other solutions. So I'll be talking about the test runs uh, at Dadri. Test run uh, to evaluate the ramp rate of the unit, ramp up and ramp, ramp down uh, character, different load ranges. Then uh, uh, minimum load, we gradually reduced it till 40% to evaluate what, what is possible. Even lower than that is possible, but we uh, stopped at 40% because there's a lot of Dadri, we had a better quality coal, uh, but in other stations where we did the test run, we had uh, average coal quality. Somewhere it was even 2700 GCB, 2800, 2900. We were able to bring down the load to 40%. Uh, uh, say, I'll, I'll rather say some techniques or some tricks uh, that anybody can do. I'll share that also, what, what really we did. Then identifying the process limitations that we did for each and every area. Based on that only, uh, the interventions were decided. Control system, that is very important. And in fact, that is one of the most important as VGB, particularly Dr. Wise has always been uh, mentioning this. Because you cannot proceed without without system. We have seen it everywhere in Dadri. You cannot leave your machine in the hands of an operator. Some operator can damage the machine, say, 16 to 20 times more than another operator. That is what we have seen while analyzing different startups. When we are doing the damage cost modeling at, at uh, NTPC and, and GSCCL units, it, it must be uniform. And, and it has to be an auto. So some of the retrofits we have identified, I will discuss on that. Ramp rate, three per there also you must be careful when, when you are mentioning this. See, without any uh, retrofit, 3% is still very difficult. Today, if you tell all the machines, okay, go for 3%, it may not be possible. if they are operating on 40% and go for, for a 3% ramp rate, they may not be able to do it unless they have some something like some other solutions installed. So, and, 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 and all these things were in a control environment with a lot of people there in the control room. Retrofit is needed to operate the unit on a sustained basis. It's not that we have tested it and just by testing the unit have achieved that a lot of people uh, I've seen in, in, in many places, many of the important uh, stakeholders in the policy making body and, and in, the, in the government, they consider that, okay, now it has been tested and capability has been proven and, and now the unit can operate without doing anything. No, it's not like that. Now I'll talk about some of the operating procedures. See, uh, in brief, I'll, I'll discuss this. Uh, when we're analyzing what needs to be done, see, now we don't have a luxury of investing money in the power plant. Already, uh, it is not in a very good shape and private IPPs, uh, they are, and you tell them to make some costly retrofit, that is not a good idea. So when we analyzed uh, uh, these things, by, simply by these two things, a lot can be achieved. This is the operational cost. 
and and suppose we are here today without any intervention business as usual so with uh, by operational modifications by changing your procedures you can achieve lot of benefits this is a box and whisker curve the benefit can be up till this level you can reduce the cost till here further along with controls you can bring it at a very low level and then it will be incremental with digitalization and other some sophisticated solutions etc lot of things are there delivery that is what we and then we have fleet wide strategy uh utilities if they are to operate their entire fleet then they can optimize lot of things to fleet wide strategy the uh, areas where we will find the limitations uh, this is when at the in uh, detail each and everything so one thing is this is the primary thing that you i think this is not a rocket science every engineer every power plant engineer know this but they are somehow they are not a very fast changing environment and they want to be very safe they want lot of factor of uh, uh, safety lot of margins lot of lot of uh, redundancy in the system so you must aim to complete your combustion before this level and if you're not able to do it then all the temperature it will combustion will continue in this area and then it will be disturbed you'll get a higher uh, furnace exit temperature and you can never control things your superheater overheating superheater spray everything will go haywire and 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 then see this is the I, trick i was telling you everywhere we achieve 40% by this simple the practice uh, analysis what we had seen that in all the plants the operators they are more comfortable in keeping one additional mill into service but by doing that they in, increase the uh, in fact they alter the air fuel ratio making the air fuel ratio more leaner and and so we had defined a particular uh, load range and the number of mills that you are to keep we had achieved 40% with 3 mills this could well be have been done even with 2 mills but since left on the unit because even if you are operating on uh, say 40% load and and then you must have some reason this is the load now you are not going to take additional mill and and take that much time so you must have still some capacity left into your mills so even this is part for a particular coal quality it shouldn't be taken as it is but but uh, depending on what coal quality so 40% you are here you are operating you okay i'll i'll go to the next slide other things uh, what we had seen is uh, primary air header pressure so when you reduce uh, the unit configuration where you have two primary air fans when you go down then many places you observe stalling in the pf fans because you are not taking the flow as per the pressure you maintain a primary air header pressure so this study was done in and faraka and dadri and, and in fact ng lab they had suggested it uh, this practice is being followed in europe and many places they modified this curve and we have asked uh, the oem also to consider this so originally it was a straight line so if you are reducing if your mill turn down ratio is low then you may be somewhere here but but till 50% turn down it should be a straight line and then after that you increase it gradually turn down is one of the operation and even for the safety of your mill safety of your boiler uh because because you need to have a particular air fuel mixture and and if it is a very rich then it may be a explosive mixture 
so that also i'll i think i have it in the next slide okay and uh, the velocity must not be less than 20 uh, meters per second uh, again the velocity must, must not be too much so as to blow away the flame from from the burner uh, another thing that we saw there that while bringing down the load to 40% in in almost all the cases we had seen that the wind box pressure was coming down to uh, almost zero and and that means uh, we didn't have individual secondary air flow measurements this is also very important then only you'll be able to optimize the secondary air flow so uh, dampers of the coal pipes which are not in service dampers over fire dampers and then we increase the wind box pressure slightly but without knowing how much actually we are operating but we able to bring uh, this wind box pressure to around around 40 mm water column and we also saw that there was an improvement in the flame so in the wind operators they don't know simply where what they in the dark this we are recommending another thing uh, 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 when you when you decrease your load to a lower level uh, the balancing the coal pipe that gets disturbed because see typically when you do a dirty air flow test in units it's done at around uh, 60 to 100% because the unit never thought that they'll be able to, they they'll be uh, required to run below 60% but when you bring down the load on actual basis and then you find that this gets disturbed and we have seen this we have evidence of this uh, in in one of the state jenkos very recently we went there bring down the load and when we saw the reports and we found out okay there was even the unit was under shutdown and we found that one of the burners was closed uh, totally and in one burner the whole burner was eroded there was nothing left in the burner so that is why uh, that is how this coal flow was going through this uh, inside the furnace and imagine what kind of combustion they were having we have very good solution by bmw steel i think they are also uh, in the participant uh, and, and, and it's a uh, variable orifice that will be installed in the coal pipes and as per the flow and other characteristics uh, with online data they'll balance the coal coal flow uh, inside this pipe so this they are supplying to many stations and in fact uh, we are planning to test in one of the stations maybe we have some test run in in one of the stations uh, we'll we'll check this a uh, fuel oil uh, fuel air combustion ratio uh, the, this is designed uh, as per the compliance of uh, nfpa code uh, nfpa uh, 8502 uh, which requires that the air flow is maintained at or above the purge rate that means not less than 25% of full low mass flow during all operations be it for the mill for the boiler this is a guideline for the safety so that is the, the turn down ratio of the mill is limited to to uh, this consideration so we recommend that do not load the machine below 50% 40% you can do it but but uh, again uh, till what level you'll go we don't know so when when you require to deload your uh, mills reduce the loading on the mills go down till 50% and if any mill is required to go below 50% take out one mill we'll see the flame improving and the, there's a lot of improvement the combustion temperature of the coal pipes of the mill outlet temperature mill inlet temperature that is very uh, especially that changes with the moisture in the coal so there is a guideline and which i liked it uh, this was presented uh, in the last igf presentation by rwe so this is a pressure in the coal what should be the temperature based on that this is available there with the indian coal it is uh, reconstructed this 
typical average Indian coal. So these are the temperatures, a brief guideline where you should keep your in mill inlet temperatures. Uh, ideally outlet temperatures, this is uh, international literature, uh, volatile materials in your coal. This all will be in the guidelines, which will be consumption very soon. You, I told you, it's be able to uh, take your meals early because you'll get your uh, uh, meal at temperature. And once you get the temperature inside your meal early, you'll be able to take your uh, meals earlier and, and uh, shorten the startup time. So by not using this, you are doing a lot of uh, damage, a lot of costs. If you see the startup cost, if you calculate uh, the no, uses and not using this CAF, there's, there's a huge cost involved. And many places, uh, this has, uh, this it was already installed earlier, but they're not using it, not usable. So uh, installing SCAP in, in Dadri. And again, uh, operational practices, when, when uh, initially when you light up your unit, uh, throttle your secondary air dampers, uh, secondary, uh, secondary air peter dampers, and, and increase the primary air peter temperatures. Uh, that is included in the procedures. First of all, you need to keep your dampers operative. Many places I have seen that these dampers are simply not operative. So these are very small steps what you can do for improving your startup or time. Yeah. Uh, uh, another problem is your uh, maintaining your furnace exit temperature. And uh, you have seen a lot of cases, there's a clinkering, there's fouling, uh, deposits in the boiler. Uh, it's a very complex thing, but you must have the uh, analysis of your coal that, that is being fed into the boiler. What is the ash softening temperature of that particular coal? And you target keeping your uh, flu furnace exit gas temperature below that softening temperature. So, curve for increase in temperature when you fire different types of coal with different moisture. You must be aware of that. You must be aware of uh, what is the moisture and what is the type of coal. Uh, it's very difficult, I know, because coal quality keeps on changing. Doing in one of the stations. Uh, there was a wide variation of coal quality. For that, maybe you need some other solutions like coal analyzers, online coal analyzers. Burner tilt is another important thing. I, th I don't think anybody is operating in auto in India, but but this is very important, and and we have recommended putting it in auto. Uh, there is no need to fear for everything. You must maintain your controls in order, and if you put it in auto. In temperatures, uh, reduction in your spray. See, just run also we had observed that uh, there was a lot of superheater and reheater. Go till the turbine, damage, have deposits on your turbine, vibration and a lot of other problems, pitting. So, so that is sprays to be avoided at low loads. Coming to the retrofit solution implemented at Dadri. So in two categories, uh, in fact, this was suggestion by uh, suggest Siemens. So one is mandatory. This would ensure safe and smooth operation with the new uh, load ranges, means 40% or, or whatever range that you are operating. Another important thing is to manage the consequences of flexible operation. It's very important. And, and safety is, is the most important, safety to man and machine. Because uh, this was a shorter time, sometimes I can and present and the entire presentation on safety due to flexible operation. First is the uh, automatic mill scheduler. 
This will do everything to take the mills in auto into service, start and stop the mills, determine which burner mill has to be started or stopped, increase the firing, loading of the mills or deloading of the uh, mills. Uh, it's difficult. Today it is done by the uh, on basis of the uh, operators. On burner failure, automatic selection of the best alternative burner because it will be analyzing online. So what is the next best? So it will automatically change over. Plant operators can remove individual burner from the choice because see human intervention will be always above machine intervention. Then we have optimization of control loops, all these MS, reheater, based on feed forward signals and on advanced system. Uh, Dadri is very fortunate, particularly that unit is already having an advanced system of Siemens. This circulation valve. This also poses a problem when there is a uh, reduction in load, when uh, more needs to be deloaded, then we have seen a jerky of valve which is fully open closed type this could close suddenly or open suddenly so we are replacing it with a control valve type steam coil there are some optional measures uh, depending depending on the what uh, the unit can afford but if they can afford it this would be really very good advanced Condition monitoring and uh, uh, about the online analysis modeling tools would be necessary for you if you operate in a real time power market. Because that time you need cost of your production because you're not going to calculate it and then because real time market will be very fast, it will operate on a web and uh, uh, you have to have this data ready online. FEM analysis that has also been suggested, but it's a costly proposition. Thermal feasibility modeling study. Uh, ideally, this is recommended for each unit, but you can conduct a study for one unit and, uh, and you can copy it on other similar units. For example, in a fleet, if you have one unit of a particular make, uh, you can copy it to that. A lot of similarities and you can still go ahead. Some best operational practices, uh, what we had seen uh, uh, about the opening of HP bypass. See, this is a thing which uh, we have been doing it 20 years back, 25 years back when used to be in the plant. I used to operate it many times and uh, this is very safe. But today, if you talk experience, they are always fearful. Like if you open the HP bypass, uh, drum unit will trip on drum level. I don't know what kind of fear uh, they have uh, because if you're not able to uh, maintain your control system in order, that is a separate problem. Uh, there were also many engineers from India who had visited Germany at least two times. I was there with them once. We had seen the practice which is widely followed uh, for a very fast load change. They op it ha has been supplied with HP bypass for this purpose. You have a typically you have a HP bypass of 60% capacity in most of the units in, in India. So even even on the nine uh, uh, PM nine uh, minutes on fifth of April. What when we had seen the grid situations? Uh, Tata Power. If they are there, I don't know on on the participants. One unit I know they operated it. They brought down the load by operating the HP bypass. So it was, this is the best practice. Pressure operation is also there, but uh, that needs. 
we were uh, doing the test run we had seen that uh, at lower load uh, we had observed uh, steaming in the economizer and then dnb so we set point to by by around 5 kg so in the test run also we also analyzing uh, what way to revise this sliding pressure operation in the best way so as to get the maximum efficiency and and then maximum operational flexibility Deflator heating and charging. It's it's very. Uh, I'm not happy to mention here that I put it in a best practice. This is a regular practice, but as people are not doing it widely, I have to put it here. This is a best practice which was being followed long time back, but but we have gone back. I start doing this. Reliable temperature measurements. control and you won't be able to put anything uh, in your control and then change your process uh, these things i have mentioned c and i optimization still less you must uh, take this thing for granted because without of c and i optimization you won't be able to achieve any flexibilization other things are repeat here I'll, I'll mention about heating blankets in the turbine. So even even it is in a stopped condition, you can keep the heated up. So it'll have a faster startups, lesser damage. This uh, it can be done only during overhauling because you need to remove your insulation. Need for preservation. Uh, there is a detailed procedure given by VGB. it's available with ntpc and and, and many of the uh, stations where uh, vgb has supplied them in fact uh, we have prepared a, a detailed uh, preservation practices layup which will be coming out very soon and in fact uh, while preparing this i have taken the best practices in in uh, layup from all the sources available it's it's a sort of indian constitution i would say i've taken all the best from everywhere and try to put it together so this document also will be available for you very soon again uh, something missing points uh, is in the preservation now there is advanced fill forming amines uh, which are being used they are typically solutions where which you use in your boiler they won't let the water stay on the surface so it's very useful for your short time preservation plasma ignition is another thing uh, by g and and at least in india one or two units must try because this is very suitable for the indian coal as per the claim because it hasn't been tested yet but the minimum load can be brought down till 10% so start preparing for these things because tomorrow you don't know because when people are questioning about the relevance of coal stations stations then you need to do a lot lot more you are doing lot of things but you need to do a lot more to so cycling advisor this is costcom by intertech this is one of the best uh, solutions that i have seen what i have seen is a low cost and is a very good solution which will give you the online cost of your cycling uh, component wise damage so epri also has some similar solutions but somehow i find don't know much about the others nitrogen blanketing of dm water sewage tanks ntp but will save lot of then the chemistry related damages that i was showing you that's all thank you. Okay. Yeah. So exactly at four um, thirty, yeah, I told you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, thank you, Mr. Sinner, for your presentation. So we collected uh, some of the questions from the chat. Um, yes, and unfortunately, we only have time to answer some of the questions. The first question is to Dr. Weise. So, from a German perspective, how many power project could adopt flexible power, and in what time frame? 
Oh, uh, Dr. Weise, your microphone is still muted. Yeah. You have to thank unmute yourself. Yes. Uh, thank you for this hint. Um, yeah, in German, so all uh, power plants have adopted such a flexible operation regime due to the uh, requirement of the market. And um, our experience show that uh, the adaptation of the six months six and um, I would like to recommend our toolbox um, where we have listed also for each measure the, the time frame for the implementation. But generally, I would say um, it's it's different for each plant. So and also. So if you have to uh, adjust um, the plant with some hardware um, changes, uh, then it, if you just adjust the ANC system. So it, there is no generic answer um, uh, possible, but um, this time frame up to a year is um, feasible. But it also takes time to evaluate the flexibility potential of the plant, so the test runs and all the preparations. So this needs to be considered as well. OK, um, so you can find the link to the toolbox that Dr. Weiser mentioned in the chat. We will also post the link at the end of the webinar again. Then we have the next question from Sata Kurana. What is the expected impact on O&M cost of two shifting of coal plants in the UK and Europe, where O&M costs have declined from two shifting operation? How does that transfer in the Indian context? So, um, yeah, please, Ms. Anchan, please start. So, cost is at uh, your important topic. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, if you are talking about two shifting, there are different scenarios which had uh, built up. Uh, like, uh, if your ECR energy charges are two rupees, then additional cost would be on two shifting mode would be around uh, another say two to three rupees. It's upon the size of the unit. It's 200 or 500. For 500 megawatt, it will be around not the exact numbers. Uh, depend upon what assumptions that you take for building the scene. Three rupees for two shifting. Because see, every time you make a start, uh, you incur some cost. I had shown you the numbers for each event. Each cold start, you had some numbers. Each warm start, you had another number. So the way you start, uh, if you're not able to keep your machines hot, then, then you'll end up doing a cold start and your cost will be higher. So on the steam end, it can be, say, another three rupees. Means... Uh, almost two and a half times compared to you. And that also would include your see. OK, uh, Dr. Weise, do you want to add something on that? Um, um, usually also very specific for the plan. So it depends what type of um, adjustments you have or what is the level of your automation and control and monitoring uh, system. So if you are able to monitor the plant and you have also you might be able to really have uh, almost no increase in your uh, own M cost, but it uh, depends on the information which you have in your plant. Uh, there, there are studies that say that the inch of two to five percent. So, but this is really very hard to say it uh, in a generic way. Um, I, I would like to emphasize that the the main issue of flexible operation is the loss of revenue because you have less operating hours. So. Um, 
this is uh, the, the, the main driver when it comes to commercial and other ways for recovering the cost and to gain in clearly uh, addresses uh, the requirement for an according market design that uh, um, awards uh, flexible operation. Okay, thank you. Yeah. You are very correct, uh, Dr. Weise. Uh, what I was talking was on the context of the Indian regulatory tariff. Yes. The market mechanism is there. Okay. So then the next question is, does the cost of startup include oil consumption or work? No, it's, it's not. The cost that is, say so there are two costs involved in that. What, what I had shown in the initial slides. Uh, one is the, your life consumption. You're consuming some life, uh, the machines, uh, means uh, fatigue and creep life. And the other thing is your EFR. Because with each startup, you are increasing a very small, maybe a micro percentage of uh, your EFR. So EFR means equivalent forced outage rate that will increase. So EFR and life consumption. It's mainly life consumption cost. Oil cost is different. It's okay. not included in this cost. Okay, thank you. So then the last question is, is the incentive for flexible operation clear for power plants in India? Will non-flexible plants be deterred to operate or will they benefit from base load generation, higher plant load factor? Yeah, there, there is uh, uh, no incentive. Uh, there is only a sort of compensation mechanism that exists today till 55% load and the compensation for loss in efficiency for your heat rate, for your auxiliary power consumption and you get some extra oil consumption based on type of your start. Uh, that is uh, after every seventh start. Below that, there is no system. There is no compensation av uh, uh, available for your o and cost in terms of life consumption of your machine and other cost. And uh, in fact, we are working with CRC uh, for this because the efficiency loss at 55% and at 40% would be very different. It's very steeply at lower load. So in fact, they are also considering and they have come out with a draft. Recently I'd seen there is amendment in the uh, regulation where they have gone down to compensate the unit till 40%. So it's all, all under transition. A lot of things are happening. And, and when the then you would never need this. See, this is for the PPA based stations. You need some sort of compensation. But maybe some of these stations who require to run on, on flexible mode, they'll operate in either ancillary services, which is still evolving, and uh, on the real time market, there are a lot of other services available. Okay, so thank you for your questions. Um, because we don't have so much time, um, I wanted to ask Mr. Banerjee from NTPC if he wants to share his view. Um, Mr. Banerjee, if you're unmute your microphone and if you want. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you so much uh, for giving us the opportunity to share our thoughts. Uh, Synergy and nicely explained operations and in fact uh, with the Dadri test run whatever uh, we are in the process of implementing it and uh, hopefully uh, um, by September October we will be in a position to implement all the solutions there and then the units to operate at uh, low load and at the same time with higher ramp rates so with that uh, and in some other experiments in other units, they say, for example, Shimadri uh, will be in a position to be the Indian power 
to adopt so that we can in situations of low minimum load operations or at a higher ramp rate so uh, we can conclude the what are the essentials and what are the uh, some of the unique features which for some of the plants where uh, typically uh, coal varies volatile matter varies the things like that so so we are uh, passing through a time where we are learning each and every steps on each and every day we are learning and now uh, with the real time market uh, is introduced uh, likely to be introduced from june the power market in india and with acd with real time market and uh, uh, we are in a zone uh, of from a, a steady uh, full load operations to a uh, flexible operations where we have much of renewable power to the grid and uh, with this i uh, thank you so much all webinar for the common awareness and at the same time we can discuss some of the key issues here at this particular forum thank you so much thank you Thank you, Mr. Mr. Banerjee. Um, yes, so I don't know, Dr. Walter, questions? Uh, yeah, I have time. So I'll, I'll try to address as many questions as possible. And, and if I'm not able to answer all these questions, I'll, I'll uh, send the mails. I'll answer each and every question at least uh, through mails, but now I'll I'll take some more. The same for me. So if we have not enough, be happy to share the views via email. Okay, thank you. Very good. So then, Dr. Weiss, how does the so we have an um, energy market. So uh, the compensation works uh, via such a short-term energy market. So if you are able to provide electricity uh, high and your costs are low, then you are uh, a lucky one. So you have to compensate uh, your, your um, costs or you have to gain your income. And uh, the other thing is that we in Germany, we have also a market for balancing um, or balancing energy or control energy. So frequency control. So that is another possibility to to, um, to earn some income if you participate there. But um, this market is now getting really tight. So it's hard for us to, to uh, see this as a real big source of income but however it's, it's there and um, the more uh, markets for flexibility the better for the power plants okay thank you very much um, then another question that just came in um, is washed coal used in above those test run of flexible operation Washed coal for India? No. Or During Europe? the test runs, I think we, no, we had I, both. Yeah, yeah. Uh, washed coal, Dadri gets washed coal, but not on a regular basis. Uh, but other stations where we did the test runs, we didn't have average. So, see, coal quality shouldn't be very bad. But range of around say 3,000 uh, GCV is possible. We had seen that in in in, in, in the last uh, station where we did this. It was uh, around say 2,900 uh, something, 2,900 kilocalories. So it's possible. And with washed with Gudadri, in fact, we could have gone even lower. Uh, because Tadri sometimes get uh, very good uh, quality of coal. And with washed coal, uh, I think 
with washed coal ash quantity is reduced a bit but not not as per the european uh, standards where and, and in us where you get 10% ash but typically 7% 8% it gets reduced somewhere even not that much but um, the coal quality is and okay. we could have gone for two meals also then um for pit head plants what is the strategy for using unwashed coal during flexible operation stations first of all there'll be less requirement for operating flexible uh, on a flexible mode because mostly the pit head stations they are uh, low cost high merit order plants and it's not the pit head when you use a washed coal it depends upon the distance from the washeries and uh, there's a lot of talk on on washed coal there was even from the ministry a uh, long time back to supply washed coal to uh, the stations which are 1200 kilometers and beyond but but uh, there there aren't enough capacity of washeries there are lot of other issues so it's uh, too good to be uh, told rather than being done uh, we are not uh, getting the washed coal they get washed coal and both but uh, it hasn't increased over the years i have seen that quantity of washed coal they haven't increased okay then next question the experience on super critical units for flexible operation below 40% uh uh in india uh, we had decided even in the ca report it was there not to operate on flexible operate last resort but uh, this super critical units they are mostly non pit head high cr so they have to operate but operating uh below the minimum benson minimum i should say on they should be operated only on the dry mode load following is okay but the benson point and and, and somewhere it is even 35 somewhere 40 50 benson minimum depends upon the design of that unit so you should not go below that because then you lose out on the efficiency 5% loss in one go so at the oral t carbon reduction that way some way because the ecr is low you are running a more inefficient unit and the highly efficient units you are not able to operate uh, operate so that way the super critical units they are brought for for the, that purpose so even if you have to operate either you stop it and start it but when you have to operate operate it on a benson point but we don't have enough experience in india still people are extra struggling we'll we'll see uh, in the future mr banerji would like to comment okay. on that or yeah yeah absolutely uh, we should not uh, uh, come to a situation that we, sh we should run those high efficient plant at 40% minimum load okay under the present circumstances uh, maybe we are running it at uh, technical minimum in some situations which are really uh, non pitted and uh, higher uh, energy cost stations but we are uh, forced to do it and regulatory regime but maybe in days to come there will be a change and uh, these plants uh, will be uh, will be uh, incentivized to run at a higher uh, plant load factor rather than uh, soft critical units low capacity units okay thank you mr banerji energy for dr weise implementation of new emission control systems can happen separately from implementation measures Yes, it can happen, but it's it's good if you have the chance to combine both to to make it in 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 one step. Um, so uh, you are able to um, commission the the flue gas cleaning 
uh, equipment uh, already uh, in a flexible operation regime. So, and with flexible operation, it's really very uh, smart to think of uh, the future operation regime and to adapt this uh, now and to include this in the whole considerable. This would be really an we in Europe, we already had uh, installations for Fluger's cleaning and we had to um, adjust their operation now in order to really um, be ready to uh, flexing. So. Okay, thank you. Then um, another question is advantage of automatic down on flexible operation. Uh, that, that's definitely an advantage. So that's what to shorten the startup and sh shutdown time to have really automated procedures to do so. So that goes along with the general advice to increase the level of automation, which really is an enabler for flexibilization of the whole plant. Okay, thank you. And I would say we have one last question to Mr. Zinner. At Dadri plant test run, how to correlate cold start and hot start ramp rate with this 3% ramp rate? Because 5% and 10% is for cold and hot. I can just uh, yes, please. Uh, jump in because I think the numbers were from my referring to uh, the, the figures at, uh, with re which were in the line of the startup are in hours, so that's not in percentage, so we don't refer to. So maybe that's a misunderstanding that we have a ramp rate of 8% during startup, so that's so that's how I uh, understand the question. So. Yeah, that is true. That is true. There's only a time for startup, startup time. How much time you bring the unit on bar and then how much time you load it till 80 percent. Time what we consider. Okay, so thank you both for answering all those.